Well, brethren, we need to realize the time that we're living in. The condition today is serious. In the news now, we're hearing about a nuclear winter. A nuclear war, and Bible prophecy says one is coming, and all indications are that it's going to come sooner than we think. That it would create a vast cloud to cover the whole earth and to virtually shut out the sun until it would be a nuclear winter. It would be impossible to raise crops or food. Not only are all prognostications that perhaps anywhere from a billion and a half up to two or three billion people would be killed by the first nuclear explosions, but soon it would be impossible to raise food. And it would very shortly and very quickly mean erasing all humanity from this earth. Now, it's been several months since we had the report that the nuclear scientists have set the doomsday clock forward one minute. I've mentioned this a number of times on the air. I've mentioned it here before. From four to only three minutes to midnight. At midnight is the doom. That's the end of civilization as we know it. I think we're living carelessly, brethren. Now, our own men, we had, well, let me say that we had quite a conference over in London recently on the production of the plain truth, and we're very much concerned about plain truth circulation now in Europe and across the Atlantic. And we're having a big increase in circulation. As a matter of fact, our production people are worried. Not because the plain truth circulation is going down, but because it's going up. And as we add another half million or another million to the circulation of the plain truth, we also add millions of dollars to the cost of operating God's work and of publishing the plain truth. The plain truth has become bigger than I think most of us realize. Of the known magazines, like Reader's Digest and like the, uh, uh, the oh, I can never think of words that I want to, the, uh, well, I don't know why a word won't come to me when I think of it, that I know so well, National Geographic. Uh, the United States is one of the perhaps four or five greatest circulation magazines in the world, that class of magazines. I think there are some that have a large circulation that we never think of, never hear of, and don't know much about. We're considerably bigger in circulation than Time or Newsweek or United States News. bigger than any of the popular magazines in the United States. We're reaching one of every 20 households in the United States, beside heavy circulations in all countries of the earth. And the last report I had, there's only two nations on earth we're not getting into. The gospel is going to the world. And the gospel has now, the gospel of the kingdom has been declared in all the world for a witness to all nations. The two we have not reached are under the communist power anyway, and they're captive nations, you might say, Laos and Cambodia. And so the situation is very serious. Now, our men who have been over there say that the economic crisis is really hitting Europe. 
It's a really serious thing. And all of the leaders of the governments in Europe want to see Mr. Reagan reelected. The people of Europe hate Mr. Reagan, and also they seem to hate Mrs. Thatcher in England. And in continental Europe, there is a noticeable increase in aversion against and hostility against the United States and Britain both. And that is strictly according to biblical prophecy, precisely what God has said. And so I want to say that our own men, in evaluating the situation, believe that we may have not more than one more year to reach the people of Europe, Africa, and Asia with the gospel. We're just getting that near to the end. And I wonder if we're not asleep over here and if we realize that time is very precious and time is running out on us. Now, I think it's time that we get back to biblical prophecy, that we see where we are now, where we stand, and what is going to happen from now on. As you know, about a third of the Bible, of course, is history of what has happened in the past, and it's a history of Israel and of other nations as they come into contact with Israel. So it is a history of nations and of governments in this world. The whole thing is about government. God has a government. He set a throne on this earth. He put a super archangel on that throne whose name was Lucifer, a cherub. Lucifer was perfect from the day God created him till iniquity or lawlessness was found in him. And he turned against God. And he said, I'm going to ascend up to heaven. I'm going to exalt my throne. His throne was there on the earth. I'm going to exalt it above God, above the stars, the angels of God. In other words, I'm going to be the most high. I'm going to take over the universe. He was ruling this little earth, which is only a dot in all of the planets and the suns that compose the entire vast universe. And so he is still on that throne. Now, we know that in history, God first created one man. He was not quite complete. God didn't finish the creation instantly. And so, out of the man, he took a rib and created a woman. And after that, the man was physically complete. He was not complete as God first created him. But he was still not complete mentally and spiritually. And he only had a temporary physical chemical existence. But God offered him everlasting life. But with everlasting life went the character of God, went the knowledge of God, a revelation of God's knowledge from God and God's love and God's spirit and God's mind to open his mind to the things of God and to the kind of character and righteousness of God. The man rejected that, and he took to himself the knowledge of good and evil. And so God closed up the tree of life, and a whole civilization has been built on this earth. And Satan is the one who deceived Eve and led her to take of the forbidden fruit, and Adam went along with her. And the whole world has gone on ever since, thinking they're doing their own thing, when actually they have been deceived and led by Satan. And so we read in the twelfth chapter of Revelation that all nations have been deceived by Satan the devil. And that's the kind of government in all different nations, men thinking that they're making and forming their own governments, their own kind of society, their own civilization. And we have been born into that type of civilization near its end. God allotted 6,000 years for that civilization, and that 6,000 years is just about up. Any way you can figure it, 
it could not go, as near as I can figure, past the year of 1996, and we're already in 84. It isn't much longer. Now, most of you are not as old as I am, and you don't realize how fast days and months and years are whipping past. It isn't going to be long now, believe me. So now, about a third of the Bible is also prophecy, foretelling the future. And prophecy is merely history written in advance before it happens. Then about a third of the Bible is devoted to telling of God's purpose, of God's righteousness, of God's plan to accomplish his purpose, and of God's instruction in character and in right living, in God's program, God's plan in salvation. The churches of this world use perhaps not over 2%, 1% to 2% of the Bible. They never quote more than 1% or 2% of the various verses or parts of the Bible. I don't know whether you realize that or not. Now tonight I want to go into a Bible study about what is prophesied for the whole world. Secondly, what is prophesied for the United States and Britain as nations? And thirdly, what is prophesied for us as God's church? And I hope to get, give this to you in a sort of time sequence. I won't have time to bring in everything, but I want to give you at least a synopsis and cover it in a way it has never been covered before in this church. Now, first, where are we right now in the panorama of biblical prophecy? Right now, we're at the point that Jesus explained would happen in a prophecy in the 24th chapter of Matthew. You've heard it time and time again. His disciples had asked him for a sign of his second coming in the end of the world, or the end of civilization as we know it, the end of this world of Satan and the coming of Christ and the world tomorrow, or the kingdom of God, which is the government that will then rule the world. Because this world, whether we realize it or not, has been ruled by Satan and his demons. In the sixth chapter of the book of Ephesians, you read that we're wrestling with a great many problems and troubles in this world, but we're not wrestling against people. Or we wrestle not, as it says in the King James, against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and wicked spirits in high places, the rulers of the darkness of this world. And Satan and his demons are the real rulers of this world. You know, I was just thinking today, what is the state of mind of the average person? What do they think about? What is on their mind? What is the attitude or what fills the mind? Well, what fills the mind of the average person is people that they see about them, things that they see about them, buildings, interiors, highways, bridges, all of the things that have been built and that make up our cities, and our country, and people, and the things that people do. That's what they see on television. That's what they think about. They think about the things that they see that are physical, that they see with their senses, they hear with their ears, they taste with their mouths, they smell with their noses, or they can feel and touch. They seem to know nothing of the spirit world that is invisible to them that they don't see, they can't hear, they can't feel, they can't touch, and yet is really ruling them and putting thoughts, putting impressions, everything into their minds. They don't think of that. 
You talk to someone like that, and, and if you accuse them and say, well, you don't even believe in God, do you? And they'll be angry. They'll say, I do too believe in God. But they really don't, you know. Just who and what is God? Well, they don't know. Is God real to them? No, he isn't. Do they ever think about him? <laughs> Not if they can help it. You begin to mention God and they become uncomfortable and want to run away. Brother, and then I got to thinking, what would be in the mind of one of us in God's church if we're as converted as we believe we are and have the Spirit of God? Well, we have the same things in mind that they do. In a way, we see these things, but we see them in a different light. And we are conscious of God, and to us, God is real. We don't see Him. We know, though, that if we could see Him, He is formed and shaped just like we are. He has two eyes and two ears. He has a nose and a mouth. He has hands and feet. He has fingers and toes. He hears, he sees, and he has a supreme mind. And he, but he is composed of spirit. And as a great spirit, he has all power. All power. He brought matter into existence. The great suns, and some suns are many, many, many times larger than our sun. And our sun is so big as compared to our earth. Well, it's, it's like a great big monstrous ball compared to a little tiny pea. And other suns are many times that big. And God had the ability to produce all of that. Not only that, he had the mind to design everything you see, all of the animals, all of plant life. Design the difference between a maple leaf and an oak leaf. The difference between a horse, a cow, and an elephant, and animals. To design the human body and the human mind and produce it. Now, man was made to become in the image of God, in character, and also in the likeness of God as to form and shape. God is our potential Father. God created us out of the dust of the ground, out of matter. But God wants us to become his children. Now, when Adam rejected him, he closed off the Spirit of God by which we could be begotten as his children until Christ, the second Adam, should come. And even when Christ came, he said, I will build my church. But even so, he said, no man could come to him, that is, come into the church. That's what he meant. Except the Father who had sent him would draw them. God himself has cut humanity off from him. Now remember, they were cut off from God, the one we regard as God the Father. They were not really cut off from the one who's called the God of the Old Testament, and in the Hebrew language it is called Yahweh, and usually you see it as the Lord or the Lord God in the Bible, in the King James especially. In the Moffat translation, it's the Eternal, or the Eternal God, or the Lord Eternal in some cases. But they were cut off from God, and Jesus came to reveal the Father and to reconcile us back to the Father. And it's God the Father we need to be reconciled to. And if you stop to think, brethren, the churches of this world, the Protestant churches, for example, do not talk much about God and about being reconciled back to God. It's only Jesus. And they think that everybody has access to Jesus. And yet Jesus himself said no one could come to him except God the Father would draw them. And in Revelation 12 and verse 9, you find that they're all deceived. You know, there is an old saying, it's not in the Bible, but there's an old saying that hell is paved with good intentions. 
And man often has, you see, man chose the tree of good as well as evil. And there is human good, but it's on a much lower level than divine good or God's good. That only comes through the Holy Spirit. And there are millions and billions that are so deceived that they don't know. And they don't live in this world. Now, we live in this world, but not of it, because in our minds is the consciousness of God. And of the fact that there is a devil and demons. And that there are angels. And that Michael is a super archangel assigned to protect and to aid us and other angels under him. And that the angels are sort of custodians or helpers of us who are being reconciled to God. Well, now let's go on. Right now, where are we? In Matthew 24 and in verse 14, Jesus said, Well, I know it by heart. I guess I didn't have that quoted out here. You know, I have to have the words typed out and enlarged, larger than any Bible, and then I have to have a magnifying glass to read it with. But nevertheless, you know, sometimes a handicap is a good thing. We get along anyway. We find a way around it. And I've had to do that all my life, find a way around obstacles and Poor eyesight is one of my obstacles recently. But we find a way around those things, and we go on just the same. But Matthew twenty four fourteen, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Brethren, that has happened. And that has happened through this work. And through the telecasts, and through the plain truth, and through other literature. Take our book with the United States and British Commonwealth and Prophecy. Over three and one-half million people have written in for that book and have received it. Now, Jesus was answering a question by his disciples. They had been down in the temple, they had gone outside of the temple, and they were showing Jesus the buildings of the temple. It was more than one building. And then later they were sitting up on the Mount of Olives, and four of them came to Jesus, as you read in Mark's version, the 13th chapter of Mark. And as it is in Matthew 24 and verse 3, uh, as Jesus sat uh, up on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? Now, he had said that the buildings of the temple would be destroyed, that they would be torn down, not one stone would be left upon another. They said, When will that happen? And then they asked him, And the sign of your coming and the end of the world, or the end of the age, the end of this world of Satan. Now, they thought that the end of the world would come at the same time. They thought it was coming in their lifetime. All the disciples believed that. Even the original apostles believed that. They were wrong, but they believed it. And so, Jesus went on in verse 21, uh, in verse 14, he said, that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, and then shall the end come. Now, he had said in verse 4 or 5 there, Take heed that no man deceive you, he said to his disciples, of something that was going to happen in their lifetime, and which did happen in the year 70 A.D., in their lifetime. It was about 30 or 31 A.D. that he was saying this to them, probably 31 and he said, many will come in my name saying that I am the Christ. They would come preaching about Jesus being the Christ. But they wouldn't be pre uh, preaching his gospel. They would have another gospel. They would have their own gospel, but about Christ, about the person of Christ. Just believe in Christ and Jesus loves you. That's what they're preaching still today. Protestants are preaching that. You turn into other religious broadcasts and you'll find 
God loves you, Jesus loves you, and we want to tell people about Jesus. We must tell them how Jesus, about Jesus, that Jesus died for them, and that Jesus loves them. And that's all they have. That's the whole message. But Jesus came with a message from God about the kingdom of God, the government of God, the character of God, and about our being born of God until we become God, even like He is. And you don't hear any of that in the churches today. That's the gospel, my brethren. Then he went on after telling the sign of his coming. And in verse 24, he said, Then shall be great tribulation, or world trouble, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this uh, to this time, known or ever shall be, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved alive, but for the elect's sake those days will be shortened. Brethren, we are the elect. Not for the world's sake, but for the elect's sake, those that God has called and that could come to Jesus. And Jesus has reconciled back to the Father. Jesus' death does not save us. You're not saved by the blood of Christ. You are reconciled to God the Father by the blood of Christ. And then if you believe, you shall receive the Holy Spirit from God the Father, and that is the gift of eternal life. That is your salvation. And the churches of this world just don't understand it. Now, that time of great trouble is what is known as the Great Tribulation. And churches all over talk about, the Protestant churches talk about the Great Tribulation. And they think that the Great Tribulation is a curse sent by God. They don't understand it. And they say the church will be raptured up before the Great Tribulation. The church won't be in it. The church will go up to heaven. And they have a a pretty way of saying it, that Christ will first come for his bride and take her up to heaven, that is the church. And they think they're all going to go to heaven. And then, after the great tribulation, some think that'll be one year, some think it'll be three and a half years, some think it'll be seven years, and uh, Seventh-day Adventists think it'll be uh, 1,000 years. And then he comes back with his bride after they've been in heaven. I don't know why they want to come back to this terrible earth after they've been in heaven all this time. But apparently that's, that's the way they teach. Now, here is this great tribulation. I'm going to read you other scriptures about that. But carrying right on here in Matthew 24, in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, then what's the next thing? Now, we're just right on the very doorstep of the great tribulation now. As a matter of fact, you could say we've had some of the real beginnings of it, but they're only just rumblings ahead of the main storm. It's not really the Great Tribulation itself as yet, but it's practically right on us now. Times already are worse than they ever were in the history of the world. Now, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall... The sun be darkened, and I wonder if this nuclear winter could be that. The sun will be darkened. The moon will not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven. And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then, what then at that time? or thereafter immediately. Then shall appear something they see now, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. That's the sign of Christ in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see, now notice they will see, the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory the second coming of Christ to rule. Now next, we want to go to 
Joel 2.31, I want to show you that the great tribulation is not the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is the time of plagues God will send. Protestants think that the great tribulation is the, the, the plagues that God will send. I want you to notice in Joel 2.31 that uh, the great tribulation is something altogether different. It says here, the sun shall be darkened. No, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Now, immediately after the great tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give her light and the stars will fall. But that will be before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now, the, the great and terrible day of the Lord is there referring to a sort of a prelude of the day of the Lord. It's before the second coming of Christ, and up to and at the very time of the second coming of Christ, plagues that are going to be poured out on Babylon and her harlot daughters. And Babylon is simply the church that came out of the original Babylonian mystery religion, and it's called Roman Catholic today, if you please. And you can guess who the harlot daughters are. Now, first, I want you to notice there will be great tribulation. That comes after the gospel of the kingdom has gone to the world. For 1,900 years, the gospel of the kingdom didn't go. They preached that Jesus is the Christ. They had the message about Christ. They told people about Jesus, but they didn't preach his message. And brethren, I don't want to say anything boastfully. But it is a fact, and it has happened. It's not something I say I will do or is going to happen. This is what has happened. That gospel of the kingdom has gone to all the world. And there is no other voice that has taken it to all the world. And that is something that nobody can contradict. That has happened. Now, the next thing is that great tribulation. Then after that will come the day of the Lord. Now, let me give you the same thing in a prophecy in Daniel. The 10th, 11th, and 12th chapters of Daniel are one long prophecy. The 10th chapter is sort of a prelude. The 11th chapter is the main prophecy. The 12th chapter is the conclusion. And the 10th, 11th, and 12th chapters all go together. Now, in the 11th chapter, and verse 40, it says, And at the time of the end, certain things, and that verse goes on, and it carries right on into chapter 12. And chapter 12, continuing right along the time of the end, and here it says, And at the, that time, the time of the end, which we're in now, shall Michael stand up. Now notice, Michael is an archangel. Michael will stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. That's Israel, and we... We know that we and the British people, oh, of course, that includes the Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders, and so on, and many of South Africa, that Michael is our prince or archangel, was sent for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble. Now, what time of trouble? such as never was since there was a nation. Same thing as I read to you in Matthew 24 in Jesus' prophecy. Same thing exactly. There can't be two such times greater than ever happened or ever will. Even to the same time, and at that time, then what? At that same time. Thy people shall be delivered, everyone that is written in the book, and... Verse 2, that was verse 1. Verse 2, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth, that is the dead, shall awake in a resurrection, some to everlasting life. I won't read the rest of it, because that doesn't happen for a thousand years later. But some to everlasting life. That's the resurrection at the second coming of Christ. Now let me give you another prophecy that says identically the same thing. All talking, now Matthew 24, Daniel 12, and now Revelation 12. 
And notice the similarity, Daniel 12, Revelation chapter 12, beginning with verse 7 in Revelation, and this is after the Middle Ages. The 12th chapter of Revelation is covered, ancient Israel, the birth of Christ, and then the Middle Ages, and then coming in verse 7 up to our present time. And there was, it's all in past tense, but should say will be, uh, war in heaven. Michael and his angels. Now, remember that in Daniel it said Michael will stand up against someone and there will be a time of trouble such as never happened. Now, notice here, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, who were demons, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out of heaven because he lost that battle against Michael. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. So there it tells you in plain language who this uh, great red dragon is, Satan the devil. The devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out, and his angels, or his demons, cast out with him. Now that is uh, down to verse 9. So the great tribulation has been caused by Satan. If you read the rest of it, you will see that Satan was the real cause of the tribulation. That's a verse or two later. I didn't have that copied here, so I won't read that. You can read it in the Bible. And you will see that the whole trouble was caused by Satan and by sin on the world and that Satan influenced the trouble that's coming on the whole earth. Now, the great tribulation was caused by Satan and, and by the world's evils. The great tribulation is on the whole world now, I've shown you what is going to happen to the whole world. Now, let's get down to what's going to happen to our people. But also, it is a time of Jacob's trouble, and we are Jacob. Now, the dying Jacob, before he died in Egypt, had the sons of Joseph brought before him, Ephraim and Manasseh. And he laid his hands on them, and he said, Let my name, Jacob, be named on them. Now his name was changed to Israel, so their name is Jacob, and their name is also Israel. And the descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh, if you read the book, United States and British in Prophecy, you will see it's absolutely proved is the United States and Britain. Britain is Ephraim, the United States is Manasseh. And we are Jacob. Now notice that. The Great Tribulation is especially on us. Well, let's see, that is primarily in the 30th chapter of Jeremiah. I'm coming to that just a little bit later. But now, prophecies regarding the United States and Britain. First of all, I want to give you something about all of Israel, but it probably, it, it's coming right down to the United States and to Britain. Leviticus 26, about Israel ancient Israel and Israel into the future in our time. Now, from Leviticus 26, verse, verse 1, You shall make you no idols nor graven images, neither were you up a standing image, you shall keep my Sabbaths. Notice now that's a command. And reverence my sanctuary. I am the eternal. If you walk, now there's a great big if, the biggest little two-letter word in the English language. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season and... Uh, the land shall yield her increase, and uh, I will give you peace in the land. Now, continuing on. 
But, now that was an if, but if you will not hearken unto me and will not do these commandments, which included keeping the Sabbath, and if you shall despise my statutes, and if that was his national laws, and if you shall abhor my judgments and my commandments and my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning ague that shall uh, consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. And you shall uh, sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. They would be taken captive, and they were. And I will set my face against you, and you shall be slain before your enemies. And they did go into a captivity, and they lost in war. From 721 to 718 B.C., Israel did and was taken into Assyria. And you shall be slain before your enemies, and they that hate you shall reign over you. And the, uh, uh, they, they were taken by Shalmaneser of uh, Assyria, and the Assyrians did reign over them. That hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when... No one pursues you. And if you will not yet for all of this hearken unto me, then I will punish you even seven times more for your sins. Now, he would punish them, and he did. That was way back 700 years before Christ. Now he's going to punish them seven times, and the time is a year in the Bible, and in prophecy it's a 360-day year, each day being a year being fulfilled, and that means a total of 2,520 years. And God would withhold the promises that he made for 2,520 years. Now, God could not withhold them forever, because God had promised these blessings unconditionally to Abraham 400 years before Israel was called out of Egypt. And God had to keep them, but now he's going to defer them 2,520 years, and that is from 721 to 718 B.C. And that brings us up to 1800 to 1803 A.D. And I will break the pride of your power. And that's after the seven times punishment. And God has broken the pride of our power, and the United States has won the last war it's ever going to win. Listen to me, brethren. The United States has won its last war. We will not win any anymore. God did win the First World War for us, and then the Second World War. But he did not win the Korean War for us, nor the one in Vietnam. And he is not going to win in Central America. And he, is not, he did not win when we tried to uh, send a, a task force over to rescue our people in uh, uh, Iran. About, let's see, that's about uh, three, four years ago now. And they met a terrible defeat. Now, about our nations in a prophecy that comes down to our time today. Let me read you a prophecy in the prophet Micah. Micah, the fifth chapter, and beginning with verse 8. And the remnant of Jacob. Now, remember, we are Jacob. The remnant is the last generation getting down to our time now. This is not ancient Israel 700 years before Christ. This is our time today. The remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people, 
as a lion among the beasts of the field. Did the Jews ever become a lion compared to other nations in the world? Did they? No. But has the United States and Britain become like a lion compared to other nations? We certainly have. Because after 2,520 years, God blessed us beginning 1800 to 1804. In 1800, London had suddenly become the financial hub of the world. In 1804, the Louisiana Purchase came to the United States, and that was all of the great Middle West added to the original 13 colonies. And we really became, for the first time, we had the wealth that began to make us a great nation. And by the end of World War I, the United States and Great Britain owned and possessed more than two-thirds and almost three-fourths of all the great wealth, the cultivated wealth of all the world. And all the other nations, Russia with her billion people, I mean, I mean China with her billion, and India with nearly a billion, more than three-quarters of a billion people, and Russia, the third largest nation in the world. And Japan and Indonesia and others that are vast, that have vast populations. And all the nations of Europe, Germany and France, Spain, Portugal, Italy. All of the nations combined had only a little over one-fourth and less than a third of the wealth of the world. And our two nations possessed it. We had the sea gates of the whole world, and we're losing them. And Britain has already lost her world empire. Now then, I want to show you in prophecy what God said he would do to Britain and the United States after we had come to that wealth which God promised to Abraham and which he gave us. And the remnant of Jacob, that's the last generation, that's the getting down to our time now in this 20th century, shall be among the Gentiles as a lion, uh, among the beasts of the field, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep. And what, what would a young lion do to little lambs and sheep? Who, if he go, uh, if he go through, uh, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. We were conquering every nation. We were winning every war for a while. But we were not serving God. We print on our money in God we trust. But we don't trust in God. I mean, the nation doesn't. I hope we in the church do. When I said we, then I was referring to the nation. And this nation is producing evil in every possible way. Homosexualities, women are beginning to run everything. Every kind of evil, rotten music, rotten everything. Families breaking down. Sex is rampant. Drugs. Crime is increasing. And we are exporting the wrong everything. Drugs, wrong music everything in our American way of life. It is a cinch to the nostrils of God Almighty. And God is going to punish our nation. We better wake up. But brethren, we in the church don't need to be punished with it. But the nation is going to be punished and very quickly now. Thine hand shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries. And all thine enemies shall be cut off. And that has happened. But, now, you haven't heard the end of this prophecy yet, but now listen. And it shall come to pass in that day, in the day when we're so strong, in the day when we're winning all the wars, in the day when we have all the wealth, in that day, saith the Eternal, that I, notice I means God, will cut off thy horses, Moffat and other translations say your war horses. In other words, our fortifications and our armaments. And I, I will cut off your war horses out of the midst of you, and I will destroy thy chariots. 
and they used chariots in war in those days when this was written. In other words, implements of war and things of that sort. And I will cut off the cities of your land. Now, I'll show you later that our cities are going to be destroyed by nuclear warfare. Nothing else could destroy them. Now, this can't be said of Jews. They never reached such great prosperity. They never were like a lion among other nations. We have been. And this absolutely proves what is in the book, United States and Britain in Prophecy. And I will throw down all your strongholds, fortifications, military uh, uh, fortifications, and I, meaning God, will cut off witchcraft out of your uh, hand. You shall have no more soothsayers. Now, that's referring to things like astrologers and things like that. And let me just pause here to say that uh, in with the United States adults, over 30% are planning their decisions, their business, and everything on astrology today. And among youths, over 40% are following astrology today in this country. That gives you an idea of what we've gone into and what God says is a curse and what he's going to cut off from our land. Now, verse 13, Thy graven images also will I cut off, and thy standing images out of the midst of thee. Go into any Roman Catholic church and you will find those images. And thou shalt uh, uh, no more worship the work of thine own hands. We worship material things that men's hands make and men's machines. Of course, men's hands make the machines, and the machines make other things. And I will pluck up thy groves out of the midst of thee, so I will I destroy thy cities. Our cities are to be destroyed. Now I'll show you other prophecies saying the same thing. And I will execute, that is, God will do it. Execute vengeance in uh, anger and fury upon uh, the heathen. And that is talking of the seven last plagues. And the heathen means other nations now, such as uh, they have never heard. Now we're going to go to Jeremiah, a prophecy. In Jeremiah 25. And in verse 3, a noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord, or the Eternal, has a controversy with the nation. Now, that's the whole world. But the nations often in prophecy does refer to the nations of Israel, and will plead with all flesh, because they are sinning. God is pleading through the world tomorrow telecast, through the plain truth. We're trying to show the people their sins. God says, cry aloud and show my people their sins. We've been doing that, brethren, and it's going into every nation on this earth. He will give them that are wicked uh, to the sword, saith the Eternal. Well, the sword today is uh, nuclear warfare. Uh, thus says the Eternal of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation. Now, this is the whole world. And a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth. Now, from that, we go to Jeremiah the 30th for another prophecy. And I want you to notice how these all fit together. For thus says the Eternal, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask you now and see whether... Oh, yes, this is the 30th chapter of Jeremiah. Ask you now and see whether a man doth uh, travail with child. Therefore, do, uh, or wherefore, do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness because of troubles that are coming. You're going to see that in the next year or two or three, very soon now. We're coming right down to that time. And, oh, no, alas, 
alas for that day, uh, is great, so that none is like it. Now, have I been talking to you about a time of trouble such as never happened since there was a nation? Here it is again. And I want you to notice that that is especially on Israel, as I remarked, if you remember, a while ago. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. <clears throat> it is the time of Jacob's trouble, and we are Jacob. It's the time of trouble against the United States and England, and Europe is getting ready to rise up against us, and Europe will reunite, and they will form a new empire, a new nation, political, with one currency, one military force, one government. They have a vast, great building in uh, Brussels. I've been there. I've talked to the architect of this coming Europe. He has visited here and he's spoken to your brethren right on this very platform. And they're working furiously to bring this thing about. He knew that I know something about these things that are coming. And he had planned almost six months ahead to come over here on July the 10th of last year. And he did arrive on precisely that day, just as he had said months before he would. And July, July a year ago, many of you heard him. And he is the real architect of this coming great nation that will be greater, probably, than either the Soviet Union or the United States. And it is the nation that is going to destroy us, not Russia, believe it or not. Now, Russia is just as evil as everybody thinks it is. That is, their government and their way and the, the, the party that is ruling it. I'm not trying to defend them at all. I'm just telling you what the biblical prophecies say. Now that day is great. It's a time of trouble such as there never was. And it's the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be delivered out of it. Now he'll get into it, but then be delivered out of it. You see, it'll be a time that God didn't intervene, no flesh would be saved alive, but for the elect's sake. The elect is partly our people. Now, most of two-thirds of our people are going to be destroyed in what is coming. I'll read you that prophecy a little later in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 5. But, nevertheless, a third was going to be delivered out of it. For it shall come to pass, and it's in verse 8 now, in Jeremiah 30, For it shall come to pass in that day, uh, says the Eternal of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck. That is the European yoke that will come, and will burst thy bonds, because the third of our people that are left are going to be in a dungeon and they're going to find grace there and come back to God there. I'll read you that a little later. And strangers shall no more serve themselves of him, but they shall serve the eternal of their God. Finally, we're going to turn to God and the eternal of their God and David, their king, whom I will raise up unto them by a resurrection. Talking about the resurrection at the second coming of Christ. You see, this is talking about our very time and the time of the great tribulation that is coming. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble. That means the United States and Britain. And it's primarily going to be against us, but it is going to be on the whole world. And it will be nuclear war, believe me. Nothing else could do what the prophecies say is going to happen. Now we want to go to the 47th chapter of Isaiah for another prophecy. Notice I'm putting these prophecies right together in a sequence, and I don't think you've ever heard them put together this way before. Isaiah 47, verse 1. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of uh, Babylon. Now, Babylon was the ancient king Nebuchadnezzar's empire 600 years before Christ. But this is not the ancient Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar. This is the daughter of Babylon in the last days. And the daughter is a female, and that refers to a church. Political governments are referred to in the male gender in Bible prophecy, and the female refers to a church. 
That's in the book of Revelation, and here it is in Isaiah, and it is in other prophecies of the Bible. Daniel and other places. O virgin daughter of Babylon, set on the ground, there is uh, no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. That's talking of the Roman Catholic Church who sat on the thrones of the governments of Europe. She did in 554. She did again in 800 in the time of Charlemagne. She, uh, she did in 554, the time of Justinian, again in 800, the time of, of uh, uh, yes, uh, the French government. She did later, I think about the 12th century, the time of Otto the Great, the German head, later in the Habsburg dynasty, and it was a Habsburg that was here last year, just a, a, a year ago, and spoke to us here, and he is the heir to that throne that same throne, and now they want to get back into power again. O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate, in other words, a church, and was sitting on over governments, as the Roman Catholic did in all those years. Take the millstones and grind meal. Uncover thy locks, Make uh, the bear the leg, uh, uncover the thighs, uh, pass over the rivers. Speaking of the one that is called a great whore in Revelation 5, or I mean Revelation uh, 17 and verse 5, and her harlot daughters are certainly the Protestant churches. It's time for plain speaking, brethren. These things are actually taking place, and they're all foretold in the Bible. And you don't find the Catholic or the Protestant churches quoting the Bible. They don't quote these prophecies. They don't dare. And no church on earth is quoting them but this one. Now continuing verse 3. Thy nakedness, that means sins, shame and sin, thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, this is God speaking, and I, God, uh, will not uh, uh, meet thee there as a man. As for uh, our Redeemer, the Eternal of hosts, this is Christ, is his name, and the Holy One of Israel, which is Jesus Christ. Sit thou silent, and get thee into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, Roman Catholic Church, for thou shalt no more be called the Lady of Kingdoms, the church that ruled over governments. Just as plain as you can be in speaking in symbolic language. And the Bible interprets its own symbols and interprets it exactly as I said. Now continuing, verse 6. God says, I, God, was wroth with my people. Israel, his people, United States and Britain are Israel today in the end time, this remnant. I was wroth with my people. I have polluted mine inheritance and given them into thine hand. The Roman Catholic Church will sit on top of this coming united Europe. She did in 554. She did in 800. She did in the 12th century. She did in the Habsburg dynasty. She did in, in the time of, uh, oh, um, um, well, eight, down to 1814, uh, Napoleon. And Napoleon, when he was crowned, he snatched the, the crown right out of the Pope's hand as the Pope was going to crown him and put it on his own head. And then Mussolini revived it as the sixth head of that beast, and the seventh one is coming up now in a united Europe, a reunification of Europe. I've talked to the leaders over in Athens, Greece. They want it so bad they can eat it. I've talked to the king of Spain, King Juan Carlos, and had a long talk with him in his office privately. And a very friendly one did that. But he's very anxious for this union to come and wants to be a part of it. And very strong for the Catholic Church. God says, I, God, was wroth with my people, that's our people, Israel. 
I have polluted mine inheritance and given them into thine hand. God is going to give us over to this united Europe. God gave us the wealth that we have. God blessed this country. We put it on their money in God we trust, but we didn't trust in God. I mean the country didn't. When I say we, I'm talking the United States, not the church. I hope we do trust in God and the church, but the nation has not. You know, Abraham Lincoln called a solemn day of fasting and prayer, and he had a proclamation saying, we didn't toil to earn the great wealth we have. And we hadn't gotten all the great wealth yet at that time. He said that it was given to us by God. Abraham Lincoln saw that, but we we don't see it, and our presidents don't see it today. They see only what the Protestant churches will tell them. God says he was wroth with our people. I have polluted, and that means he's going to do that in the next few years. Mine inheritance, I have given them into thine hand. The Roman Catholic Church will sit astride of this coming United States of Europe. And did, uh, did show them no mercy. We will not be shown mercy in this, brethren upon the ancient hast thou very heavily laid thy yoke we're an ancient nation and we're the descendants of that ancient nation ancient Israel and we're the modern descendants now in Jeremiah 30 I read to you about the yoke that would be on us this shows you who put that yoke on us and it will be a united Europe headed by the Roman Catholic Church It's time we wake up and realize that these prophecies are real. They are telling us what is going to happen, and very, very shortly. Now, in the fifth chapter of Ezekiel, a prophecy I've read you already, our cities are going to be destroyed. Well, listen to this. Verse 12. A third part, and this is speaking of the house of Israel, a third part of thee shall die with the pestilence. And with famine shall they be consumed. There will be famine and we'll get into a pestilence of disease. Of the four horsemen of Revelation, the sixth chapter, the first white horse are the false prophets. And they've been here ever since the time of Christ. And then the famine and the disease epidemic that are going to take so many people are the, uh, let's see, the red horse is war. And the the pale horse, the black horse, and the pale horse are the famine and the pestilence shall be consumed in the midst of thee. And a third part of thee shall fall by the sword. Now a third of our people are going to die by uh, famine and pestilence and disease. A third of us by nuclear warfare and destroying our cities. Will there be enough cities to take one third of our whole population? by nuclear war and uh, shall fall by the sword round about thee. Of course, the sword is a symbol of uh, armaments, and they didn't know about the, to write in that day. No one would have understood it if they'd said nuclear war. They didn't know what it was, and they hadn't discovered it yet. And I, God, will scatter the third part. Now, a third of our people will be left alive, and they're going to be scattered and taken prisoner. And another uh, chapter, I think I'm coming to that, says that in the prison, or or the Moffat translation has it in the dungeon, they're going to find God and they're going to repent and cry out finally to God. And that, brethren, will be the fruitage of our labors and our work. I want to tell you there are millions and millions of people listening to our telecast. Look, we're getting up to 10, 11, 12,000 telephone calls from every telecast every week now. And nearly always over 5,000. And it's alarming our people that produce the plain truth because it's costing so much money to send so many plain truths out. It's growing so rapidly. And so we go on every day. I don't know, I listen into all the sermons and the 
We've had some wonderful Bible studies Friday nights. When I come to a Bible study, I just wonder if I can produce anything as interesting to you as you've heard, as important, as valuable to you. They've been so good, but I, we don't hear much about the time that we're in and the sobering thought of what is coming upon us. And we've got to wake up and not be lulled to sleep. Now, a third part of thee, the famine and the pestilence, a third by the sword, and the rest are going to be scattered to the winds, and they, in other words, they will be prisoners of war, and they're going to be taken, some to South America and some to Europe. Now, continuing, then shall mine anger, that's God's anger, be accomplished. And I will cause my fury, and that's the last plagues at, coming at, uh, at the time of the coming of Christ, after the great tribulation, I will cause my fury to rest upon them, and I will be comforted, and they shall know that I am the eternal. People don't know who God is today. As I said a while ago, you say to someone, you don't believe in God, and they'll raise up and be angry. They'll say, don't tell me I don't believe in God. I do, too, believe in God. But they really don't, brethren. Because to them, God is some mythical, mystic something who is not real at all. To the average person, they have no real concept of what God is. Like one woman said not too long ago, well, it was two or three years ago, I remember this. So, well, God is not real to me. God is not real to most people. Brethren, is he real to you? God is so very real to me, and I hope he is to you. And when God says he's going to do these things, you'll find out how real God is, and very soon now. Cause his fury, and fury means that's last plagues, referred to every time upon them. And I, God, will be comforted, and they shall know that I am the Lord, they haven't known it up till now, and that I have spoken it in my zeal when I have accomplished it, my fury upon them. Now, he's going to punish the nations, this fury. He's going to punish them to wake them up and bring them back to him for their own good. A lot of people don't realize the plagues God sent on ancient Egypt when he delivered Israel out of Egypt. Back in the time of Moses, was sent in God's love to teach the Egyptians a lesson and to teach them that the gods they worshipped were not real gods and that the true God is real. God punishes those he loves. And God's punishment is always corrective, never vengeance. Now in Ezekiel 6, that's the next chapter in Ezekiel, and verse 6. In all your dwelling places, the cities shall be laid waste. Now, I read you that in two other prophecies before this. Our cities are going to be nothing but nuclear warfare. Hydrogen bombs could destroy whole cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, Detroit, St. Louis, our great vast cities. They're so big, the kind of bombs that have been used even up into World War II couldn't destroy whole cities. Unless there were just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Your cities shall be laid waste, and the high places shall be desolate, that your altars may be laid waste, and made desolate, and so on. Let me see if I... Don't, your images will be thrown down, and your works will be abolished. Now, the Great Tribulation will be on the whole world, but especially on our people, as I have just read to you. Now, let me see. I want to read you a little later. Here's some more in Jeremiah 30. What I was reading is you. Well, here I had some more of Jeremiah 30. I thought I'd finish that. And uh, Jeremiah 30 and verse 24. 
Oh, this is the last part of that uh, Jeremiah 30. I didn't read all of it, so now I'll drop down to the last verse. The fierce anger of the Eternal shall not return until he have done it. That's uh, when he is going to, to, it, to, the great tribulation will be the time of Jacob's trouble, as I read at that time in this same chapter. And until he have performed uh, the intents of his heart, in the latter days you shall consider it. You see, it wasn't a prophecy for ancient as it was a prophecy for now. Now going right on into Jeremiah 31, following Jeremiah 30 that said it is the, the great tribulations, the time of Jacob's trouble. Now Jeremiah 31. At the same time, says the Eternal, will I be the God of all the families of Israel. Now, when Israel has become a number of nations, all the family means all of the nations. All of the families, that's plural, meaning all of the different nations that have developed into from the old ancient tribes of Israel. And they shall be my people. You see how it's going to finally come out? Thus says the Eternal, the people which were left of the sword And I read you how a third will be left of the sword and be taken captive. The people that were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness. And some say in the dungeon they'll be imprisoned. The Moffat translation has uh, dungeon from the original Greek word, or the original uh, uh, Hebrew, rather. Uh, Even Israel, when I went to... uh, uh, cause him to rest. That's, that's the time when our harvest will really come in. Brethren, there are millions of people that are reading the plain truth. Seven million copies go out every month. And in many cases, as many as four different people read every issue. Millions are listening on television. Everywhere I go in Europe or around, in London, in uh, in uh, Germany, in France, in Paris, and this last last trip in uh, uh, Vienna. People come up to me and recognize me. Oh, I watch you on television. They're visiting over there on vacation, and they see me in television. You have no idea what vast audience we have, but our programs are so strong on television Everybody doesn't call in, and everybody doesn't, we don't hear from them. Many, many times I hear people and talk to people that say, Well, I've been listening to you, but they never wrote in, they never called in. I was down in the home of the mayor of Los Angeles, and that was the time when the president of Austria was there, and since I have had dinner with him in his own country, and... uh, a voice came up and called me by name. I turned around, and there was Muhammad Ali. And he said, well, I listen to you all night. I watch you on television. Oh, yes. Well, I said, thank you, champ. I'm glad you do. <laughs> and he was very well dressed in white, a nice white suit, very snappy looking. So the champ watches. Now in Jeremiah 31, verse 3, The Eternal has uh, appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved you uh, with uh, an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you. Again, I will build you. I'm using you instead of thee. And you shall be built... O virgin of Israel, our people will be built again, all that are left of them, and then during the millennium and after, thou shalt again be adorned with thy tabrets, and shall uh, go forth to the dances of them that are that make merry. Then notice, thou shalt yet plant vineyards upon the mountains of Samaria, back over in the Holy Land. Well, I won't read all of this, but uh, 
finally it says, Arise ye, and let us go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. And then coming down to verse 31, I didn't have that here, I won't go into it tonight. But it says that then he will make a new covenant with our people, with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And that's the same thing that you find also in the 8th chapter of the book of Hebrews. The new covenant that will be made after the second coming of Christ. And that is the covenant of the kingdom of God. Now the old covenant he made on, with Moses, he only made them into the kingdom of Israel. This will make them into the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of Israel. Well, let's see, here's some more in verse 7 and in Jeremiah 31. For thus saith the Eternal, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations, and we have been the chief of the nations, the Jews never were. And this is speaking of Israel, and it can't be speaking of Jews. Publish you, praise you, and say, O Eternal, save thy people, the remnant of Israel, the remnant of the last generation down here before the second coming of Christ. Then, oh yes, I still have more Jeremiah 31 here. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from uh, uh, the uh, uh, coasts of the earth. Some will be in South America. And uh, with them, the blind and the lame and uh, the women with child and them that traveleth uh, uh, with child together. Uh, a great company uh, shall return thither. Now, oh, let me see. And carrying on, I think I have more here than I had time to read. Let me see how the time is going. And time is just about up, and I'm not going to be able to finish this tonight. They shall come with weeping and with supplications. Well, I lead them. That's the way it's going to finally turn out. And Christ will come. And I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters uh, in a straight way and shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. That, of course, is Britain. Well, I won't take time to read the rest. But Jeremiah 50 Let's see, that was in Jeremiah 31. Now here's just a little verse in Jeremiah 50, uh, in verse 4. In those days, and at that time, says the Eternal, the children of Israel, that's Britain and America, shall come, they and the children of Judah, that's the Jewish people, together, going and weeping, they shall go and seek the Eternal, their God. Then what I wanted to do, and I don't have time to cover it tonight, I wanted to show you what is going to happen to the church. And uh, oh, here's some more from Jeremiah 50. I do want to get that in before we close tonight, if I may have just that much time. See, they shall ask the way to Zion with their faces thitherward, saying, Come ye and let us, uh, let us join ourselves to the Eternal, in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. Now, his people are Israel, America, and Britain. And the preachers, Roman, Catholic, and Protestant, have caused them to go astray. I don't think the preachers of God's own church have caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have uh, uh, gone from mountain to uh, hill. Uh, they have forgotten their resting place. Well, now that was it. And then I was going to come to uh, the prophecies of Revelation 3, Revelation 12, and other things. And then in Matthew 25, and uh, Revelation 7, and Revelation 5, showing what is going to happen to the church. I won't take time to go into that tonight. You've had enough for one Bible study, and I don't think you've had those prophecies or read them or studied them recently. Now, I've given you nothing that is new tonight, but I don't think you've 
been conscious of these prophecies for several years. And it's time we are conscious of them again, because we're down to that very time. And we need to realize the time, and we need to be praying more than we have been, studying the Bible and getting our thoughts and our minds on God and the things above, and not the things of this world. Maybe some of us have had our minds too much on Olympic games lately. Just game after game after game after game. I never realized there were so many things, as you see on, on television now, on the Olympics. Well, we're just crazy about games and sports. And about everything except God. Let's get our minds and our hearts back on the things of God, brethren. 